someone said to me the other day, you know, why didn't you do any, why didn't you guys do anything about it? You know, it's really easy to say that in 2022 when we've got all this cancel culture and, you know, Harvey Weinstein and, you know, we, you know, say no and me too and time's up and all the rest of it. But for many, many years, like you don't know, realize what's at stake. Like when you're an athlete and you cause trouble, you, you're you gone. My lived experience as a privileged white cis chick from Toronto, you know, you take my lived experience of, yeah, I was sexually assaulted and I blah, blah, blah. But, you know, I'm not just, I'm not blowing that off. But when, I'm, when you take a lived experience of an athlete that is coming from the poorest tribal village in South Africa, and people think it's, you know, sort of romantic that she ran to school every day in her bare feet. Well, she ran to school every day in her bare feet. She didn't have running shoes. Mm -hmm. And that's how yeah. she got to school. Today on the show, we are joined with film director Phyllis Ellis. Her latest documentary, Category Woman, shed some light on some heartbreaking, disgusting truths of some serious crimes going on right now with some women athletes from around the world. Wrongful gender testing based on false science, insane surgical procedures, and straight up discrimination, sexism, racism against women who happen to produce high testosterone to the point where, to the point where their gender is being wrongfully questioned based on old-timey fears of strong, powerful women. And there's a lot of heaviness into this episode, into this documentary. The few things I said right now only scratch the surface. And I really recommend checking this film out. It was a huge eye-opener personally for myself. Some of these topics you'd think, oh, maybe I'm watching a documentary from the 50s or the 60s, but all this shit is actually happening right now, today. And as uncomfortable as a lot of these subjects can be, I think this is a very important film. And I thank Phyllis for making this and also coming on this platform and further explaining all these subjects and getting this message out any way we can. So if you listen to this and this is a very important topic to you, I really recommend checking out the movie. If you live in Canada, you can go on TVO.org and watch the whole thing. It's an hour and 15 minutes. Um, when you're on their website, you can hit the documentary section. And I also know it's been doing some screenings around the world as well. And please let us know what you think and even hit some shares on this conversation. Because again, this information is very new to me and this is very important and we can only hope for change because a lot of the things uh, these women in this film have been through are absolutely wrong and heartbreaking. But uh, yeah, I can go on and on and on. But let's jump into this conversation with Phyllis, who can give you further details on this issue. A lot of people who listen to these segments, um, I'm sure they're used to me doing stuff around films of like some lighthearted subjects and stuff like that. But I just want to say like, I really appreciate getting informed about these type of topics too, that may have not been on my radar. And um, even the documentary, it kind of left me with like a feeling of like anger, sadness, but also at the same time, it's, it's very important. I think it's something that uh, everybody should watch as well. And I just want to know, like, uh, what's uh, brought you towards this this subject and how did it come on your radar and why, as a filmmaker, did you want to put this out there and let people know? Yeah, that's kind of a loaded question. So yeah. I was an athlete and I, I always say I didn't retire, I quit um, because of, um, you know, um, it, you know, issues around uh, un intolerable environment. Um, and, uh, and so I left sport and when I, when I left, um, you know, somebody really wise said to me, you know, don't leave cause you can't change anything from the uh, outside and you'll just be on the outside. And my dad said, uh, you can be right, but you can be dead. Right. So I was kind of dead. Right. At the time. And, um, and I was on the outside and how many ever years later, um, through sort of a series of events. I mean, obviously I had kind of followed what had happened to Castor Semenya 
in 09 and thought it was disgusting. Um, but then I, um, one of my sort of mentor friends, Dr. Bruce Kidd, um, I connected to Peoshni Mitra, Dr. Mitra, who's the activist in the film. And then, you know, just started talking to her and talking to other people. And then she introduced me to the athletes. And, you know, sometimes with film, you know, you, sometimes you make like a hard decision. I'm going to make a film about this. And sometimes the film just starts talking back to you and then you're, you're, you know, you're in and then you're going, you know, and that, that's what happened with this film. Yeah. And I can imagine too, especially, uh, probably meeting all the women, hearing their stories too. And even like, as you dig deeper too, it's like, oh my God, like some of it was just mind blowing, disgusting to me of like just crimes against humanity and all that. And just pure ignorance from just these uh, committees who run these different athletic like situations. And I just want to know where, where do you think is like the core of like, this might be like a hard question to answer, but the core of this ignorance towards these women, like uh, where do you think that comes from? Um, also a very large question, but uh, I'll kind of try and do Cole's notes on it. Um, so the fear around strong, powerful women competing in sport has sort of been around since women first entered the Olympic uh, stadium, you know? And so I think the first off record sex test was with uh, an athlete named uh, Kinyu Hitomi from uh, Japan, and it was in the early 1930s. And then Helen Stevens, the first sort of on record sex test. And the big fear was that men would be masquerading as women because there was this, you know, impression that strong, powerful women that didn't sort of meet the beauty standards even back then of, you know, soft and, you know, all of that kind of um, pretty approach to womanhood at that time sort of infiltrated into sport. And so then the questioning of our sex, um, our gender, uh, uh, started then and then moved into the 40s where we had to get doctor's notes. So you had to have a doctor, a, a note from your doctor saying, proving that you were a woman. Moving through that, then into sort of the mid 60s when they got really bold and said, you know, we're going to have everybody prayed nude, all the women prayed nude. And the, this is, you know, sex testing is all athletes from all sports, winter and summer. This isn't just, you know, a handful of women at this time. And then official sex testing was mandated um, between 68 and 2000, continued with the Olympics uh, into 2000. Um, and where we were femme tested, gender tested, sex tested, and you got a card and your card said, yes, you passed. And sometimes if you forgot your card um, and you had to be retested, sometimes you would test and you would fail and then you would be humiliated. and. Um, you know, there, I can name athletes that that happened to. And sort of in the 2000s, there were athletes. So with the, then what, say, track and field, the IAAF, International, whatever, Association of Athletics Federation, um, they um, went to uh, ob observation. So when you get doped, um, you have to pee in a cup. But it's not like going to the doctor where you go into a room and you have privacy. It's it's you are actually in a cubicle with somebody staring at your body while you're peeing in a cup. And so they would look directly at your anatomy. And if they saw something and guys had to get, you know, they observed them going because they were trying to stop, um, you know, cheaters, you know, people that were that were using anabolic steroids or some sort of doping to enhance their performance. But then they'd look at our bodies and if they looked at me and said, oh geez, I don't know, something's not quite right. Of course, everybody's anatomy is different and our, you know, we have differences in the way we, we look, our hands are different, our feet are different and everything else in our body is different. Um, they would say, oh geez, and they'd whisper out me to the medical advisors, they'd say, oh, yeah maybe you should do a blood on Phil because she's looking at, you know, she doesn't look, we, something didn't look quite right, in my opinion. Um, and so then women were whisper outed and a lot of careers were destroyed. And then it became sort of this focus on the global South. 
And really what happened with Castor Semenya, because she had such a dramatic win, like she had a really a beautiful win. And the fact that she was strong and powerful and a fantastic woman athlete wasn't adequate at the time. And they were questioning her um, and uh, questioning who she was and who she was told she should be, you know, at that time. She was only 18. And then her medical records were exposed to the entire world, which is a human rights violation of all kinds at, you know, full stop. And then it started to become this huge thing that they had to figure out how to keep her off the track, then they couldn't keep her off the track. And then how do we medicate? How do we break down? And then over time, it became about testosterone, which is the hormone. And then if you have, so the women that are sort of guided by these regulations, and it's not just track and field, it's FIFA and FINA and, and other, other sports that are um, mo um, moderating who is and who who can and who can't compete um it it then became focused on levels of testosterone and if you're a woman and you had a higher than whatever they deemed within their their paid for science by their own organization normal um then you were you were excommunicated from sport but in the meantime um, they were medicating women to bring their testosterone levels down. They were, and again, as this, the film shows, uh, performing kind of experimental operations on on athletes as well. So, you know, all, all under the guise of fair play. Um, but if fair play isn't bodily autonomy and human rights and uh, and inclusion, I don't know what is. So it, it's a, it is a complicated story. But as the as Jim Bunting says in the film. You know, it's complicated in the science, but very simple in the humanity, right? Mm, yes, well said, R really well said. And um, yeah, even it was interesting watching it too, because it seemed like even a push towards, I guess, like this wrongfulness seemed like it was by like trashy media in a way throughout history from yeah. even you mentioned Helen in the 60s to even now she's recent. yeah man. yeah is this be a man as she's like winning a race which is probably like the most pivotal moment of her life you know exactly Do you think like maybe just these trashy media outlets trying to get that kind of clickbait uh kind of pushes towards these athletic commissions to oh, lean you know, in I, I think it's I think it actually turns the opposite I think that yes it's clickbait for sure uh, but I actually think it's the attitude toward uh, like sort of the overarching attitude toward women in general um, when you look at gender discrimination but then when you look at you know gender and race discrimination it's a whole other conversation but you know, yes, of course, somebody leaked Castor's medical records to the guy, whatever his name was from Australia, who then put it onto the front page of all the newspapers. So she woke up the next morning and her entire w world was rocked and she didn't even know what they were talking about. And, you know, it none of these are simple. Like when you go and get tested and then when you're tested further, like these are really invasive uh, tests. So they, like, you know, all to run around the track twice. Like, like, it's not like, you know, there's a world war gonna happen if they test high for, you know, like it is literally about sport. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, they talk about leveling the playing field and fair play. Well, you know, I'd say safe, safe, creating a safe space. So regardless of what you think of the science, which is unproven and, and uh, you know, shoddy at best, and, you know, there's, there's no direct line uh, other than the epidemiologists and the scientists that have been involved for years saying that they're women, they should compete as women, they live as women, they compete as women. Um, but when you look at, you know, you could compare it to like the tobacco industry when they said, hey, it's not, we've done our science, cigarettes, no problem. Mm -hmm. And so they, so doubt became the product. And that's the same thing. It was really interesting. I was in the Hague uh, not too long ago and somebody said, well, you know, how come you didn't ask all the athlete women, uh, the women athletes that think that they're, they have an advantage. And really what I wish I had said is it's really not about my opinion or anybody else's opinion or because you have a, you have a right to play. You don't have a right to win. And if you mm -hmm. want us to eliminate all of the best athletes for whatever reason, 
um, so that you can win that what what's what is that about sport that creates sort of the dynamic of there's just people that are better than you and that's just what happens mm -hmm. on the other hand when you look at the science because it's not proven and because it's based on uh science that was paid for by the organization so if it was an independent group of scientists that were doing peer-reviewed studies and they prove it was proven that law okay fine but it isn't and so when you look at an industry whether it's big pharma big chemical big sport big whatever um you look you when and the, and the science is paid for by the organization um then how does that become uh you know science that we can trust mm -hmm. so if you follow the science and you follow the humanity you're sort of coming to the same conclusion as to why are we doing this yeah it I found it so crazy too, like how you even reached out to the people who are in charge of the testing as like uh, Sebastian Cole and even all them and <laughs> said on the film that they did not want to be involved or even like make a statement to you. Uh, did they like send something back to you or just, just ghosted no, you? I mean, so as far as world athletics or IAF at the time, no, I mean, I did speak to the communications person and, you know, we had it all set up. I mean, Seb is a contemporary athlete of mine. And, you know, I had no problem, you know, getting their side of the story. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't really agree. Um, I'm not a journalist, so to speak. So, you know, what is a balanced argument? Great mind once said to me, you know, we, we all spend so much time in these balanced arguments. And, it, you know, if you look at climate change, if we hadn't tried to have a balanced argument in mid 70s, early 80s, where, you know, big oil was saying there's no there's no problem. And then, you know, the environmentalists were saying, I think we're having a problem. We mm -hmm. probably wouldn't be where we are today. So I'm not really you know, I took a point of view and that I'm um, and I, I went all in. So I my point of view represents the point of view of the, you know, the experts and and advocates, activists and scientists in the film. Um, but, um, I think that, uh, you know, when it all comes down to it, um, we're all human beings and we should be treated with respect, what, no matter what sector we're operating in. Right. Yeah. A hundred percent. And even like, um, on that topic too, one thing that was very heartbreaking was, uh, kind of hearing the stories of these women after being tested or, even as far as having like surgical procedures, uh, I think her name was uh, Nagesa. Um, Nagesa, yeah. yeah. Um, her story like uh, really broke my heart about like her surgery and then being told um, to just pretend you have an injury and not talk about what really happened. And the people who put her through this didn't even catch up on her to make sure she's okay or anything to it. No, because when you have surgery like that, you get all your hormones get stripped. And so you're basically hormoneless. So she was hormoneless mm -hmm. for 10 years. Well, that causes osteoporosis, brain damage, uh, you know, ocular, you know, dysfunction, like you, you hormone, you, we need hormones to live. Mm -hmm. So you can't just rip someone's hormones right out of them and then say, see ya. And, you know, and under the auspice that, you know, just do this little operation and you'll get back right, you know, right back on the track. <clears throat> I mean, when I was a, an athlete, what they did was they would put a cast on someone's leg. So if someone failed their, their sex test, gender test, excuse me, or whatever, they would put a cast on the athlete's leg and send them home. And everybody basically knew they failed their gender test, but everyone pretended like they didn't. And then the athlete got sent home with a cast on her leg. That, that wow. actually happened in 84 um, when I was in L.A. Wow. But, but you know, at that time, someone said to me the other day, you know, why didn't you do any, why didn't you guys do anything about it? You know, it's really easy to say that in 2022 when we've got all this cancel culture and, you know, Harvey Weinstein and, you know, we, you know, say no and me too and time's up and all the rest of it. But for many, many years, like, you don't know realize what's at stake like when you're an athlete and you cause trouble you you're gone mm -hmm. so you're walking this thin ice all the time you're trying to be a good person you're trying to like make it work so that you play so that you compete so that they put you on the field so that you because you're in you know you it's sort it's extremely monomaniacal you know you're pretty self-focused and when you take so my lived experience as a privileged white 
cis chick from Toronto, you know, you take my lived experience of, yeah, I was sexually assaulted and I blah, blah, blah. But you know, I'm not just, I'm not blowing that off. But when I'm, when you take a lived experience of an athlete that is coming from the poorest tribal village in South Africa, and people think it's, you know, sort of romantic that she ran to school every day in her bare feet. Well, she ran to school every day in her bare feet. She didn't have running shoes. Mm, and that's how yeah. she got to school. And so maybe she maybe she just developed an amazing ability to run because she ran from when she was six years old to when she was 15, 16 kilometers every day to school because that's the only way for her to get back and forth. Mm. I mean, that's sort of a broad statement, but it's, it's um, you know, and too for those athletes, you know, when they win and they get a little bit of money, it pays for their community. They feed their family. They put their brothers and sisters through school. You know, it's, it's their job. And what's at stake, you know, if you want to level a playing field, then you provide proper nutrition and coaching and all the things that we have an advantage. That's a performance advantage, what we have in Europe and in North America. So if you want to make the Olympics even, as Dr. Bruce Kidd says, take all the athletes to one city in the world and have them live there for two years. Same nutrition, same bed, same income, same everything, same training, same running shoes, same everything. That's when that's when you that's when you level the playing field. So all this other jargon about advantage in the the you know, it's 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 like there there's not like thousands of women with high T. You know, there's mm-hmm. a handful of women, so it's not like. What did what Paula Radcliffe says? It's going to destroy women's sport. No. Yeah, no. No, because there's still a woman at the end of the day. You know, well, and we, there are women at the end of the day, and also we fought too hard. Like we, <laughs> Title IX in the states, and you know, I fought for equal rights for athletes when I was a kid, and you know, we've all fought too hard to get. But our conversation in North America, and certainly the Eurocentric standards of beauty on what a woman should look like when, you know, Zine Mangabe says it at the beginning of the film, some bodies are marked black and brown mm-hmm. women are marked in all the ways they are different. Um, you know, they're marked as insufficiently human. How do you castigate a category of human people as insufficiently human by throwing their gender into doubt? It's the same thing they did with Michelle Obama when she was on the cover of time magazine or what they do with Serena Williams, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, it's it's different because it has a different kind of racism based on, you know, what, what you know, happens in North America or certainly in the United States, but it's it all comes, you know, stems from the same uh, source, which is, um, you know, gender and race discrimination based on appearance Mm -hmm. yeah and it's it's uh, again like it's just so heartbreaking and especially like you do talk about and like it's just everything um of the way a lot of these athletes who are being tested like grew up like running to school with no shoes and to make it to a stage like that and have yeah. that moment and then that moment turning into something else that's just very dark and weird is it's it kills me like that that really hurt to yeah. see that in the film you know yeah it was, it was interesting because um an athlete an olympian called me from another country a while back he'd seen the film and he said he sobbed because he cried because what had been such a beautiful experience for him, like the pinnacle of his life and and the most the, the most extraordinary memories he has now was competing for his country and, and being an athlete for his country is like the complete opposite from mm-hmm. how Annette, her sport experience, which started out as she was Ugandan's athlete of the year. Mm-hmm. And, and then, you know, and then she, you know, these women disappearing. Like I, I, you know, when sometimes when I introduce the film, I'll say, you know, women disappearing, human rights violations, forced operations. You know, you'd think I was talking about some autocratic, weird regime from across the world, and I'm not. I'm talking about 
sport. Yeah, and the Olympics and like just the yeah. stuff you turn on TV and it's yeah. there like everywhere. And that, that's right. And I mean, I don't. I mean, I think that you know we all want to believe in sort of the ultimate fitter, faster, stronger, or whatever the Olympic ideals are. And you know, to the IOC's credit, and and because of the athletes and the advocates, they've they've sort of designed what they're calling a new framework looking at inclusion. And they're not gonna allegedly, they're not gonna sex test anymore. They're not gonna, they're not gonna do anything at the Olympics. But what they've done, sport is kind of like the Vatican. So I always describe it like there's mm -hmm. the Pope, and then there's all the archdiocese, the archdiocese of track, the archdiocese of field hockey, swimming, canoeing, you know, kayaks, whatever, all the different sports. They all have their own pod and it's like a and and it's called the autonomy of sport so each one of those archdioceses operate completely autonomously from the vatican from the pope mm. president of the ioc so the pope and the vatican can say whatever they want we we think it's terrible what they're doing to young boys we think we're wrong but what's happening in the downline of the archdiocese they don't want to know except for when something bad happens and they're like, oh man, now we got to go and, you know, do something about it. So what the IOC said was, yeah, we're not going to do it anymore, but each one of your archdiocese of sport, you, you have autonomy. So you do whatever you want. So basically world athletics can clean out whoever they want before they get to the Olympics. And, and, uh, and the IOC is just, you know, so on one hand, it looks yeah. like they're being inclusive and awesome and on one hand, they are because it's a, you know it's a big step toward um, the it, it's a big step um, being on the right side of history. But the world world athletics just put out a new a whole set of new regulations and basically took so they they what and what they do too is they conflate both issues are equally as important, but uh, they conflate the trans issue, which is equally as important in an important independent conversation with the DSD or the, you know, the, the women that are, are, have naturally high testosterone and they conflate them. And so what they did was they said that, I think the root regulations were the 400, the 800, the mile, I think were the, were the events that these women couldn't compete in. So they all started to switch events. Um, yeah, the 48, the 15 and the mile, I think. So, um, now the new regulations that came out two weeks ago said no you can't compete at all so there's this really phenomenal athlete named Fran francine Asabi. she came she got a silver medal in 16 at, at uh in rio i think it was and then um she then they took her off the track and she said basically that and she um she switched events so she switched to the 3000 and she won. She's had great success. And it's very, very hard to switch events, right? You're really good at what you're really good at. Mm -hmm. And um, But she did. And now they've just taken her off the track again. So I imagine there's yeah. going to be some pushback from the athletes. But the new regulations were devastating for, for a lot of women. Wow. And even like, I'm sure if I saw like a synopsis of some of these issues that are going on, I would think this is like a documentary going to be about the 60s or 70s, but it's actually now, <laughs> like what's going well, on. Yeah. I mean, I was saying yeah. too at a QA and a the other night, like if I just said it to you, if you hadn't seen the film, right? Mm -hmm. And I just said it to you, and then I told you it was written by Margaret Atwood, you'd believe me. You know, a sport that's doing operations and that are calling women men and that are, you know, and then there's these things and there's this science and then there's a, you know, there's this witch hunt and the women athletes have to hide and their governments are trying to kill them. Like it, it's it's like a Margaret Atwood novel. It's like a dystopian world, but it mm -hmm. actually it's our world. And you know, people said, Well, why didn't you like we didn't know you were being sexist? I don't know. It's it just like you just did it. You didn't even say no. Now, when young athletes ask me, I say, you know, no is a sentence. It's no period. And you can say no. You don't mm. have to, you know, you don't have to be sex tested. You don't have to have anything done. Problem is, is when you're on the, you know, in the global south and you're isolated and you don't have this kind of me too, you know, this, this strength within these sort of cancel cultures, they're barely on 
um, social media, you know, as much as they can, but they have to drive to a cell area, you know, when they're living, mm -hmm. you know, when they're training kind of in these remote areas um, and they don't have anybody to support them. And, you know, the other thing too, we don't realize is a lot of these countries are extremely religious. So you have a daughter that's, you know, this superstar uh, winner and you're, you're living in the, in the village and, you know, your comprehension of even, uh, you know, medical health, it, you know, maybe, you know, you don't go to a gynecologist regularly or, you know, it's just, that's just not the way of, and you're heavily Christian. Uh, and let's say in a country in Uganda, when, if you're othered, you're killed or put in jail. Mm, when yeah. you call someone out like that, that's why Annette had to um, seek asylum in Germany because her life was in jeopardy. Yeah, th that's another thing too from the film too like uh when you you put the, like a, a spotlight on that too of just them feeling like their life is in danger where they have to leave their home to feel safe and be who they are and oh, it's, it's 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 just so much and uh and yeah, yeah I, I really appreciate you putting this together too because Again, this is something that uh, I'm new to learning about too, even though it is like an uncomfortable subject. I think it's very, very, very important. And uh, right right now, I know in Canada where I am, it's uh, being pushed by TVO. And I heard it's going um, to other places too around the world. Is this right? Uh, well, we were, it was just in London, England. Nice. It was in the States a bit. And then it was in London, England. We had a, a screening in South Africa. Um, it was just in the Hague at a, a really Tony festival called Movies That Matter, where they they um, highlight the activist and the film. So that was really nice. Dr. Mitra, who's the activist, main activist in the film, was honored at the festival, which was really nice. Oh, beautiful. Um, and then, you know, it, it's going to be in Portugal at the end of the month. And, you know, you want the film to be seen, but you also want the film to be... Um, seen in a sort of a, a, a like a wider sphere like on a on a, a streamer you know like mm -hmm. we know the names i you know just whomever yeah. so that we're working on a sale so that you know someone could turn on netflix or hulu or amazon prime or whatever wherever it wherever it lands nicely um so that more people can see it because you don't want to spread too thin and then have it seen too many times so that then it sort of jeopardizes the opportunity to make the sale. But then with these kind of films, there's always kind of an impact campaign that can go along with it that sort of, you know, sort of improves the life of the film, but also creates change. So what we're hoping yeah. to do is have an impact campaign that has, you know, pushes on um, the, uh, the, the powers that be to um, that enough people start to know about it, that, you know, maybe that the, the conversation, not the film itself, it's just the one thing of it, the film is everybody's kind of in one place at one time. Yeah. Right? Yeah, for sure, too. And um, yeah, that'd be fantastic, too. Uh, especially it's kind of like reminding me of like the impact of movie such as Blackfish has, which was like a different right. subject, but yeah. it totally took down SeaWorld, Marineland as of very, very recently, you know, and um, I could only hope something like you, the piece of work you put together could do that the same, because, again, at the end of the day, it's like a, just showing these crimes against humanity and something needs to be done about that yeah i mean that that's the other thing is that it's just the human rights part of it right like, mm -hmm. so you know no matter how you feel about whatever you know high tea low tea you know whether you know how someone looks it has nothing to do with performance like it's not like when a guy wins a race they're like whoa he's handsome you know i mean <laughs> nobody gives a shit what he looks like um uh, none of the most athletes male athletes are ugly but you know <laughs> by, by all intense purposes i'm just kidding but <laughs> but um you know nobody's nobody's you know if they're good looking maybe they get another deal but nobody's nobody's judging them on how they look um but um i think that uh it, it it it's funny because you think how things change and how things remain the same. You know, it, it just reminds me of 
like, shit, I did all that work as a feminist when I was a kid to then in 2023, I'm having a conversation about human rights and sport. Like, aren't we past that now? But I think anyone would agree that nobody would want anybody that they knew that was 18 to be subjected to that kind of abuse. These give these yeah, facts. I think one thing I learned from the film as well, too, is uh, as much as I think uh, nowadays we're so progressive, yeah. there's situations where we're very not so in in yeah. ways that I didn't even realize. And it's even making me wonder, like, just kind of question everything. Like, what else darkness behind different curtains yeah. are going on and, yeah. and stuff like that? Yeah, it's so true. Like, so I said, somebody asked me the other day, you know, um, you know, what are you going to do next or whatever? And I said, well, I've taken on big pharma and now I've taken on big sport. Um, you know, ha, ha, ha. Maybe I'll take on the mafia. And the moderator said, oh, they're all the same. Yeah. And I thought, oh, yeah, OK. Yeah. And uh, and it's sort of true because, you know, the the, the operational, um, you know, uh, what do they call that corporate culture, uh, you know, run by a whole bunch of white guys at the top, it, you know, it ends up in the same place. And I don't think, you know, and someone said this to me on the last film I did, it's not like a bunch of people sat around a table and said, how are we going to kill women today? Yeah. You know, I, I, I don't think that the modus operandi is, you know, they, but they have this notion in their head that they're doing the right thing. And it's a small percentage, but a powerful percentage. And isn't that the way in every sector? It's a can be a small percentage. I mean, Jesus, you know, so my friend said to me this morning, you know, Trump could actually become president and be in jail. Yeah. And I thought that's that's true. Mm -hmm. Because there's no law that says that a convicted criminal can't be the president of the United States. That's something I didn't know either. That's oh, okay. Well, wow. talk about dystopian. I mean, yeah. So when you think about, um, you know, this idea that and the fear and the uneducated fear, and isn't that what happens with everyone? It happened with COVID. It happened with Trump. It happened mm -hmm. with you know anything that sort of sort of spirals that has a little bit of truth to it, because um, you know myth becomes truth over time or truth becomes myth over time however you want to say it and this thing gets spun and and what it is it's the question well maybe she it well maybe i don't know that must be why i lost i mean the chick in the film lindsay whatever her name is um who says i, I just don't know what to do and i'm sure they're gonna do something about it so, <laughs> yeah. so they took them all off the feet off the track right so she she came i think she came fifth it, uh, yeah, she came fifth, I think, or sixth uh, in uh, in Rio. And um, and it's like, you know, the fourth place um, person, Margaret Niasabi, won by like one one hundredth of a second. Like they, they were so close. It wasn't like she she beat her by half a track. Right. Mm -hmm. But then all of a sudden she was a man because she meet, you know, beat beat the Canadian. And um so it, it was just because Melissa wasn't fast enough that day. Yeah. And it, I mean, people get mad at me when I say that, but it's a, just a freaking fact. Mm -hmm. Pastor was first, Francine was there, and Margaret Margaret and and and, and Melissa were like this, and, and she, Margaret just edged her out by a fraction of a, of a second. And then what's her name? Lindsay came fifth. So they took them all off, all the women off the track day because of the regulations, and she went to run. And uh, she didn't even make the uh, the finals. Yeah, <laughs> none of them were on the track. None of these powerful women were on the track, and she still didn't make the finals. So I'm like, yeah, well, boo hoo. Mm -hmm. You know, you're still not fast enough. You're still not fast enough. People are going to win. People are going to lose. That's what sport is. And I'll tell you something else really funny. And I had it in the film, but I couldn't get the. Um, I couldn't get the uh, the the rights to use it. And I couldn't figure out how to fair use it, which is another way that we use footage, archival footage and documentaries. And it was Sebastian Coe winning, because he was a famous, famous runner, right? 
world champion. And so I had footage of him passing and he beat his opponents by half a track. And he was like Mr. Hero. And then I had Caster's race and she, her margin was half of what Coe's was in this particular race, just to say, oh, we had no problem with him running by half a track. Yeah, for sure. And he's the guy doing all the testing and, and everything. He's the guy doing all the, all the testing. <laughs> That's and, wild. You know, he wants to protect and under the guise of fair play. And, you know, we want to create a level playing field. Well, sport isn't level. Some women are six foot seven. Michael Phelps' wingspan is 30 feet and he's got size 82 feet. And, and they're like flippers. Are we going to cut his feet off? Because yeah. he has a performance advantage? Probably not, right? Yeah, that's a, that's another thing. Just the, I guess, the sexist way of like just seeing everything too. It's like, <laughs> this is only happening to the women. The guys are just oh, the man's, whatever. You know? Man's never been sex tested. But mm -hmm. even within women's sports, so you could have a woman that's six foot seven and a, a volleyball player, and you could have a volleyball player that's 5'10". Does the girl with six foot seven, because she has a performance advantage, get her half of her leg cut off? No. no, it's because we're talking about gender and we're talking about you know the 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 um the other parts of the body that people don't want to talk about and mm -hmm. and you know that um you know the sort of the idea of you know how someone identifies is how they identify and that's just how we're going to have to do it and if the rest of the world in every other sector is 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 in that space then sport better catch up because that's just where we are in in our world right now yeah not fair good not good you know it's just the way it is yeah and it seemed like um just kind of the cadence of seeing like these athletic commissions uh from the footage you have them going to the courthouse too uh you can tell like just in their cadence they believe they are in this right whether it's this is just like an idol ideology that's a, been passed down to them you know it's it just seems like sheer like ignorance to me from the little i've seen of of like their personalities well, I mean, pretty, big, pretty big commitment to being right you know yeah. um, but you know as it you know their 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 science was not sound and um they use, as Bruce Kidd says in the film, they use their own in-house scientists. Well, how is that okay? That's mm -hmm. like, you know, Johnson & Johnson saying, well, talc doesn't cause ovarian cancer. Our scientists say that. Mm -hmm. Or Monsanto saying, you know, raw pesticides, no problem. Our scientists say that. Well, why is it okay for sport to say, our scientists say that this is this is the level and this is right? Yeah. Uh, and anyway, you know, I think it's um, we're at a stage in our, you know, evolution based on the scientists in the film and the research that's been done that there's, you know, there's no clear, there's no clear road. What we know and some of the, some of the, the doctors and scientists that I interviewed aren't in the film, but, um, you know, once you start questioning you know, any, somebody's anything, you're, you're, you're going to cause a lot of trouble for that person. So, and, you know, do it quietly then if you want to, you know, don't, don't make it some big public thing and out someone for, you know, a very personal medical history that it's nobody's effing business mm -hmm. at all. Facts. I'm just running around a track. I'm putting yeah. my running shoes on and I'm running around a track. Mm -hmm. I'm not like, you know, going into your house and stealing your, you know, computer. I'm literally running around a track twice. And it's, it's sport and it's competition. And, uh, you know, and you know what, this whole thing about protecting women's sport, we don't need to be protected. We just need a safe space to create, you know, to compete. Mm -hmm. I don't need to, I don't need any protection. You know, nobody needs to be protected. That's so, mm -hmm. that's so misogynistic even to say that. And even, um, I, I use like the analogy of blackfish kind of causing some changes uh, with that documentary. Uh, maybe for a final question, what do you like dream of happening from the reach of this film? Like, is there any like definitive, like little goals you uh, of change you want to see and, or 
maybe hope can happen from all this? Um, yeah, it's a really good question. You know, because you don't want to get grand grandiose of oh, boy, the film to change the world. Um, <laughs> you know, I think um, I think it that uh, how can the film be used as a tool with with all the other incredible work that's been done in this space for over 10 years, 15 years, you know, can the film contribute to change and to, you know, maybe changing people's minds, maybe someone that feels one way, watches the film and feels completely differently about the subject, subject matter, excuse me. I think, um, you know, it would be fantastic if it started a large, larger conversation in the sports space um, maybe with uh, the Center for Human Rights and Sport, if they had a look at the film, um, if the IOC has a look at the film. I mean, even if World Athletics has a look at the film. I mean, it's really hard to change, um, you know, mm -hmm. the hope or, yeah. or, 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 you know, soften um, Trump. But, um, you know, kind of these extreme um, ways of thinking and, and, and then telling someone that, that they're something they're not, and then under, then, 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 then underlining with, no, we're not, we're just saying it's about this, but that in the main, to back to your point about the media spins out as high testosterone equals man which is uneducated and incorrect and just not true. But with our, within our own perceptions of X, 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 Y, which does not define a man or a woman anymore, but everybody still thinks it does. And then people get scared. And when people get scared, then there's fear ensued. And then they have these attitudes toward, you know, humans. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Well, um, I truly believe just there's power in awareness and even awareness is the first step to change so yeah i just want to say thank you for putting together this documentary too i feel like i i've personally learned a lot and watching stuff like this makes me wish there was something i could do but i feel like oh, sometimes this, doing this is awesome you know like that like just doing this is really nice to talk to you and thanks for having me on and and for taking the time to let me share a little bit about the film yeah you're definitely welcome back anytime i Again, appreciate the extra layers of context on this too. And uh, I'll continue to share snippets from these interviews and Thanks. even like uh, the film as it goes on and let people know uh, um, with my tiny platform where they can see it and everything and oh, and uh, continue to do that. So uh, thank you so much again, Phyllis, for your time. Absolutely. Okay, see you later. Yeah, have a great day. Yeah, you too. Thanks again to Phyllis Ellis for speaking with me. I know a lot of these episodes are usually fun and lighthearted, but uh, I really appreciate this one. Um, this was a very important talk, and I'm, I feel proud to share this with people. And like I mentioned in the intro, if you want to check out this film, you can go to tvo.org, click on the documentary section, and watch Category Woman right now. It's an hour and 15 minutes long, and it's very, very eye-opening, and there's even more stuff in this documentary that we didn't talk about in this conversation. I really hope this film can get the reach it deserves and cause the necessary shakeup to make some change. And also, before I go, I need to thank all you very special people on the Patreon page who've been showing love and directly supporting the show. First up, the new patron and old friend Mike Carniello of the Testing with Mike YouTube channel. He produces awesome content. Go sub to Testing with Mike. Appreciate you, brother. And also, Amanda McKnight of Top 10 Nerd. Ryan Watkins of Ryan Radio. The wonderful Jenny Potter. Ryan frickin' Campbell. The legendary Devin McBride. My favorite soul singer, Saber, and last but not least, Francis Coffer, aka my mom. If you want a shout out at the end of all of these episodes, and also get these episodes way early, like right when I am done, the conversations I have on the Zoom call, I just take the file, raw, uncut, uncensored, drag them onto the patreon page 
you can go over to patreon.com slash the creative imbalance and sign up for that and also go to bed at night knowing you're a badass motherfucker who supports raw uncensored independent media so love you guys thank you again we got a ton of more episodes recorded that i will be putting out for you as the weeks to come so stay tuned to that and have a great day